<laughs> well, welcome. Every oh, I feel yeah, like I'm so taking a show. Yeah, taking go for it. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time out to come uh, to sit and chat with us. We want this session to be a very interactive session. We don't want to just talk to you, and we're not going to do death by PowerPoint. Um, and uh, we want you to be able to hear your feedback as well as kind of share some of our thoughts around the topic. So thank you again for coming. So I'm going to turn it over to my dear friend Tyler here. Uh, yeah, so, so the topic here, uh, we're talking about um, kind of what happens when you go live with OpenStack and kind of the decisions you make there. And main piece of that is when it comes to customizations. When you decide to do something non-standard with OpenStack, uh, is it a good idea? You know, where is it a good idea? Where is it a bad idea? Um, but let me see here what we're going to start with. We have a couple different topic areas we want to cover. Um, and I think the first place we, we just want to talk about in general is consumption models, right? So Walter, you're with Rackspace. What does Rackspace mm -hmm. offer from example? Like what are the different models that you see with OpenStack? Right, right. So uh, if you're not familiar with, with Rackspace, uh, we were the uh, co-founders of OpenStack. <coughs> um, and and we, we believe very heavily in a managed cloud approach. That is actually our tagline, number one, to managed cloud provider. Uh, we believe that uh, we can provide you a great service by helping you manage your OpenStack clouds and take away and alleviate that stress of you doing it yourself. And when I say manage it, I mean at the very deep operator level, standing it up, making sure uh, it's running, upgrades, and all the engineering below the scenes, and make it so that you can just consume the top layers, right? You can just consume the services, consume the resources, consume the storage, and not have to worry about managing the environment. So that's, that's our belief as to how we think OpenStack should be approached. Yeah, and, and being with, with IBM, we're, we're kind of in that similar mindset. Uh, but there's some of the other options out there, right? So obviously, we can just go download it ourselves, right? Yeah. What, what does that look like? Um, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> do, just do it yourself. Oh, yeah, DIY. So um, I, I'm from Cisco. We actually do OpenStack, too, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we also have a managed product, which is what I work on, called MetaCloud. And, and you'll notice, one thing I've noticed in this space is that as time passes, more and more vendors move to a managed offering. Um, but there's a full spectrum. Right, from complete DIY where you're building your own packages, um, you know, patching everything manually, all the way to you, know, you don't ever even log into the hypervisors or the control plane. You have another company managing that for you and you consume it like you would a public cloud. Right? Um, and there are pros and cons to, to each of these. Right? Like, yeah. So why would, why would I want to do it myself? So usually, if you're doing it yourself, it means you ha have a good amount of OpenStack expertise in-house already. You've got some really awesome OpenStack engineers. You want to run trunk projects. You want you want to run you know do a lot of active development yourself. You know write your own patches, um, have you know bleeding edge features and functionality, and support it all yourself. Right, which you don't get if you go with a distro, which usually are, are weeks or months behind trunk, um, or with a managed service, which is usually even farther behind. Sure. Yeah, that's that's like you mentioned. That's the other option is doing a distro. Um, generally, the distro vendor is doing the packaging for you, which is very nice, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, it's one of the challenges with DIY is, is packaging yeah. up those OpenStack services. So that's that trade-off of <clears throat> someone else is taking care of that for me, but I have to wait for them to do it. Um, but then now you have someone else you can call when you have a problem. Right. So I mean, that's that's one of the areas where we see people going to the distro. As we have some OpenStack people, um, we we want to work on it ourselves somewhat, but we we need yeah. some handholding. Yeah, we, we need, we need a, a hotline to call when yeah. things hit the fan, yeah. you know. So, so what does that mean for, for upstream? So right. if, I, if, I'm, if I'm a Rackspace customer and, and, and I have, we've identified a bug that's affecting us, how does that get upstream? Right, right. So that's actually a really good question and a really good point. Um, and what we've found is that you know, it, can be, uh, it can be a love-hate relationship in those situations, primarily because we obviously create, we have a product that we sell to our customers, and we're able to give you the four nines of, of SLA on top of your OpenStack Cloud because we do standardize on that product, right? So if there is a bug that is found, we will actively work with the customer to try and, and, and contribute code back upstream to fix that bug, but it takes time, right? It's not immediate. It's not you know, overnight. Um, and then there's also the flip side of that, which is if there is a service that maybe is not as mature as you would like it to be yet, we can actually help to make that service more mature and then contribute that code upstream as well for everyone else to consume later on. So that, that's yeah, kind of how that works. On, on the whole spectrum, right, like with, uh, with DIY, you're responsible for upstreaming the code, for interacting with the community, for you know, maybe writing the code and yep. submitting a pull request on, on Git. With a distro vendor, you, know, you probably have the ability to submit a ticket through them, you know, Red Hat or Canonical or whoever, and 
you know, hope that they fix it in, in a timely manner. Right. Um, with a managed service vendor, it's, sim it's a similar situation, but usually you have a little more leverage to twist their arm because you're paying them a lot more than you're paying Red Hat you know, to make sure that your service stays up and their SLAs involved and everything. Um, and, and ideally, you know, they have a, a larger uh, footprint with whatever vendor you're talking to, um, so they have a little more clout to, you know, twist Red Hat's arm or Canonical's arm to get the packages pushed out faster, right? So, so in that case, the workflow is we've identified a bug that's affecting us. It has to go to the vendor, say the distro vendor or the managed service vendor, who then potentially commits it upstream. It gets into mm -hmm. trunk, and then it has to feed back down through yeah. that vendor's packages, then down to your. And, and with the managed stuff. service vendor, I know in our case, and, and probably in Rackspace's case as well, if there's like a critical bug, we right. can patch it ourselves mm -hmm. as like an emergency interim fix until mm -hmm. that gets upstreamed. Mm -hmm. um, Fortunately, you know, OpenStack's been a lot more stable recently, and so that hasn't been as much sure. of an issue as it sure. was, you know, say back in like the Diablo Essex time frame when it was happening all the time. <laughs> sure, good, good and, time. And, and I mean that's the same thing for us for IBM with with our managed offering. It's a similar kind of thing. Was we try and get it upstream um, because anything that you start living off a of fork is uh, is you're adding a lot of work every single cycle. So it's getting upstream is key, but you know, being able to apply it locally uh, is important as well. So And uh, you, I mean, you don't have to necessarily choose one consumption model and stick with it. I have right. a couple customers that have you know 20 plus AZs and they have a few that they have built their own DIY and they use it to test the upcoming OpenStack projects, figure out how they're gonna incorporate those when it's supported on the managed service side um, and just to give their, you know, give them some in-house expertise on OpenStack. And they generally use that stuff for dev, dev sure. test. Um, and that's actually a really good point. I'm happy you brought that up because you know the message that that message you know just to kind of re, re you know repeat that message is is that you don't have to just choose one consumption model. You don't have you know that it doesn't mean that if you do, do you do it yourself that you have to keep doing it yourself. We have customers ourselves who have spun up their own OpenStack clusters and are running them, and they want to spin up additional ones maybe in different parts of the mm -hmm. world or different regions or just maybe outside of their data center, and they'll come and talk to us about that. So you can actually mix yeah. and match. And you know, OpenStack is OpenStack, which is the good news. So you know, it's it's, yeah. it's all good. Yeah, we saw that interrupt. Uh, demo this morning, right? Yeah, and it's absolutely. And, and the thing is, like, you can staff for a dev environment. You can have like three full-time heads for a dev environment, and that's great, right? But you can't do that for for prod. If you want, if you want four nines availability, right. you're talking eight eight plus heads, mm -hmm. right. and that's a lot of OpenStack yeah. engineers. That, right. That's actually bringing us to a great point. Mm -hmm. Staffing. So if if you're doing DIY for an entire environment, what are we looking at staffing wise? You think you think eight? I think eight is like the bare minimum for prod, and that's we, we actually I did a talk earlier yesterday on uh, called Broken Stack, <laughs> and we interviewed a whole bunch of customers who had failed OpenStack deployments, and the the consensus was basically <clears> like eight is the bare minimum starting point for a production twenty four. Seven sure, environment. Sure, sure. What about so? Let's say I'm I'm, I'm doing manage with with one, you know one of our companies. What sure. do you think the minimum staffing is? It's obviously not none right. on the customer side to to get that. Done. Right, right, right. So I'm actually a firm believer in reusing resources, and what I mean by that is that um, I you know I talk to a lot of different uh, customers and give kind of workshops on how they, you know their path to the cloud. Like how do you go from virtualization to the cloud? And one of my slides that I always present is is that you have technicians and engineers and sysadmins that work at your company that can very easily become OpenStack operators, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a solid Linux background, or if, even if you're a DBA, believe it or not, you have skills that can apply to dealing with OpenStack. So you know I, I would say that you would definitely want to have you know around the three or four uh, time you know uh, a number of employees if you're even dealing with a managed service provider yeah. because you want to make sure that you have staff in house that can I don't want to say challenge your managed service provider because I don't want you to challenge us <laughs> but want to be have the expertise and the knowledge to know what you want what how to ask for it how to set things up and make sure that things are working the and way it, they and expect a, a big part of the role of, of the OpenStack operators is end user enablement right yes. which your managed service provider they're not going to be able to if you have you know 1500 developers Absolutely. working for you they're not going to be able to support all of them so you do Correct. need some people in house yeah. who are skilled at consuming OpenStack sure. to help enable those people to, to use it properly, right? It's Absolutely. a different level of skill, right? I mean, if you're talking about you're going to totally DIY your OpenStack, you know, you're troubleshooting rabbit queues, you're doing yeah. pretty intense stuff where some of them may make that transition much easier. Right. Hey, you have to understand how OpenStack works, how to create projects, right. do things like that. Understand how to communicate when something's broken, like, hey, we think there's a Nova scheduler issue. Right. How do we, how do yeah, we do that's, it? That's a great distinction, right? Because on, on the managed service side, you need like, like three or four people who right. are like pretty skilled with OpenStack, yep. but not necessarily people who can operate you know, and, and maintain a you know, four nines uptime on, on an OpenStack cluster, do upgrades and all that sure. stuff. Whereas on the DIY side, you know, you're doing everything from soup to nuts. You know, distro is somewhere in between. Yeah, I was gonna say, what do you think on the distro? <laughs> it's, it's kind it's of the, the, the mix, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it depends 
in my mind, and when I talk to customers, my, my question to them is always, you know, what, what's your strategy with OpenStack? Like, is OpenStack just a platform that you want to consume, or is having OpenStack expertise in-house a competitive advantage for you? Is it, is it a way that you want to differentiate your company? Um, and, and if that's the case, mm -hmm. you want to build a practice internally. A managed service might be something that you want to use to get out the gate faster, right, get it up mm -hmm. and running, but eventually you're going to want to transition to, to a dis probably a distro-based model, right. um, sure, possibly sure. a DIY, depending on, you know, right. if you want to do OpenStack development and stuff like sure. that. And that's ge generally the... Yeah, that makes Message sense. That, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, speaking about that, like if you're going to build a uh, practice, how how would you you know how do you suggest customers go? They say, hey, look, we're we're not we don't have we have a bunch of VMware admins. How do, <laughs> we we want to do this cloud thing. We want to do it with OpenStack. We want to go open. Where do we start? And so, so what what I've heard consistently is. You generally, in general, you cannot cross-train VMware admins to be OpenStack engineers. You need to find, if you want to train someone on OpenStack, they need to already be a full-stack engineer. So they mm -hmm. need to understand, uh, they need to be a solid sysadmin. They need to understand development, at least be able to read and troubleshoot Python, right? They need to understand security, monitoring, networking, um, right? right? And, and at that point, someone with that skill set can become an OpenStack engineer pretty easily. I mean, it'll be six months ramp period, right? right? Absolutely. Um, but the thing is, there usually aren't that many people in an organization with that skill set. So sure. Um, you, you need at least like a couple really solid people like yeah. that, and, and I'd say you know bring in an expert from the outside if you can to bootstrap your practice, sure. right? Maybe two two or three heads yeah. if you can if you can swing two or three OpenStack engineers, which is challenging. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, I think I think yeah, the thing is you know I think the thought process is well VMware is virtualization, so this is close to it where you're almost better mm. off with the companies being more successful. Or yeah. hey, we no. our Linux admins yeah. yes. are more comfortable. You know, that's a better building block starting point than it is. Hey, I'm a, I have a Windows background. I do VMware. I totally I'm better agree off with, with that. I do Linux or even DBAs. I said right. where DBAs aren't you know Linux experts, but you know right. running databases on Linux, they they have enough of the Linux skill set to uh, to kind of go that route. Yeah, I agree with that. It is, and it's coming, working at Cisco, you know, we, our customer base, we, we have cutting edge people, but I'd say 80% of them are on the, early, the late end of the, the adoption curve, right? Very conservative customers. And we see a lot of them struggle with this, the conceptual shift from, uh, you know, mode one, virtual, virtualization, hardware mediated HA to, you know, mode, mode right. two, agile cloud, uh, yeah. application mediated HA. Right. Yeah, and I think even the biggest <clears throat> challenge there is just even, um, Organizational policy, yes. more stuff than it is. We don't understand the technology. Yeah, it's we're trying security, to how we apply. The security groups like, yeah, you need to go through this manual approval process yeah. to Absolutely. provision a VM. Yeah, fill out this yeah. piece of paper. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. I I, I also uh, agree that there is a lot of organizational changes that need to happen in order to really successfully adopt OpenStack. I mean, one of the first things that I've realized is that moving to the cloud, there's so many like features of you know, it's agility. You you know, you, you it's self-service provisioning. You know, you you have more hands-on, more control over your environment, but all those capabilities are not necessarily may not be the most important capabilities to your organization. So the message I want to give there is that you need to pick the capabilities and features that are most important to your organizations or most important to your business units and focus on that and involve those business units in making those decisions. And look at your OpenStack cloud as a service, not as individual services, but as a service you're going to offer to your business units. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a different consumption model. They'll have to learn to consume IT in a different way versus what they do now, which is instead of asking for one VM, they'll ask for 10 because it takes you 30 days to get them another one. Um, you know, you have to teach them that you don't have to ask for extra. Uh, it is here for you. Um, it is not an infinite. In other words, it does have an end. You know, people think the cloud does not end. It does end. A private, you know, private cloud does end. Um, uh, have a max capacity, but, you know, have them consume it as a service. And, you know, so that's just some of the things yeah. I've, I've realized. Yeah, and I think you hit on one thing there is deciding what goes into your cloud. And I think that's a big uh, kind of a, a thing that's often discussed within, you know, talking even between mm -hmm. vendors and customers is, hey, there's all these plugins for OpenStack. There's mm -hmm. all these yeah. capabilities available. It's Python code. We can just edit it. Like, yeah. where, where do we, do, you know, you know, what's your thought process if a customer says, like, hey, we want to we wanna run this hardware and we want to run this networking and we, you know, building their OpenStack cloud. Kind of how do you handle that? Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good question, right? And that's where I think, you know, we, we've all kind of been on the same page up until this point, but yeah. I think this is kind of where our opinions are going to diverge, right, in terms sure. of uh, there, there's this spectrum of trade-offs, right, with how, how opinionated and rigid is your distro versus uh, flexibility and, mm -hmm. and potential, you know, instability, um, you know, requiring longer times for patching, upstreaming stuff and everything like that. And so, um, you know, we're... Uh, we're with MetaCloud, um, we have a, an extremely opinionated OpenStack install. We're not flexible at all in terms of which projects we support. Mm -hmm. um, and our, our 
kind of threshold for adopting a project is extremely high. Like we, we are not using Solometer today. We have a, a alternate solution that we've created that collects mm -hmm. all the metrics and scales, you know, because we have customers running thousands of nodes, right. um, Solometer doesn't work at that scale, yeah. right. you know. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so you, you, what, 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 what options are there available for a customer like? So, so where I typically do design, you know, is around, you, you, you kind of size node capacity around CPU and memory. Sure. The, the biggest flexibility is network and storage, right? Okay. Um, you, can, you can build, you know, uh, low latency, extremely high throughput networking, you know, or, you know, and, and it's obviously on the Cisco side, that's, that's one of our focuses. Sure. One thing that, that we do that's a little different is um, all of our Neutron runs on hardware. It runs on the Cisco ASR hardware oh, wow. on virtual routers. Um, which is, so no, no software routers, hardware-based failover, hardware-based performance, which is pretty cool. And then on the storage side, you have a million options, right? You have ephemeral, uh, you know, SSDs yep. or, or spinning disks. You have uh, host aggregates you can build. You've got Ceph, Ceph. converged mm -hmm. storage. Uh, you've got, you know, external enterprise storage. You've got Swift okay. object storage. And, and all of those, there are a million different use cases customers have, right? And, and I think that's, I'm a storage SME, so I'm probably a little bit biased, right? <laughs> but, but talking to customers, you know, Usually, there, there is a very specific storage configuration that's ideally suited, and most customers, in my experience, have not been good at identifying. Everyone just, oh, we'll just run everything on NetApp, or we'll run right, everything right, on right, Ephemeral, right. and it's like, right. no, you know, you've got you some more legacy-looking persistent data stores sure. that need to run on something like, like Ceph or a, an enterprise storage platform. You know, you want to run as much on Ephemeral as possible because it's the cheapest, sure. you know, and then archival and everything on Swift, sure. et cetera. No, that yeah. makes sense. So, I mean, that, yeah, it's definitely a place where I think um, you know, from a from a mindset perspective, kind of disagree there. So, from from IBM, um, Bluemix private cloud perspective, we are very prescriptive. So, not just on the OpenStack side, but also um, you can't bring. You know, the networking is set. We mm -hmm. use you know, Linux Bridge with provider networks. We use Ceph. Is the, you want block storage is Ceph? You want <laughs> object storage is Swift. Um, this is your options. Well, what if we want to use you know OVF? No, this is and and our thought process around it is. The first question is, well, why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the response is, it's from the, the infrastructure architecture side saying, well, we want to make the, we have this visio of how we want to plug all our, our cool Cisco stuff together and we want to use this feature. And, and it's never like, well, do the developers need that? And it's like, oh, well, we didn't even ask them. You know, <laughs> right, so right, a lot of things right. we've seen is when we push back and say, well, why do you want this? Like, well, we want to be able to do on the networking side, for example, say, we want to be able to you know, limit VMs from talking, we want to micro segment uh, you know, our VM. So we don't want a VM, even if it's yep. on the same instant, you know, same host to be able to talk to each other only on certain ports. We sit in the security groups. We want to be able to create networks on the fly and, and connect them. Like you can do all that stuff without any of those other things. So, mm -hmm. so that's been our, our main push mm -hmm. on there is we don't want to add something that, that affects those cycles you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, okay, cool. We, we have this custom networking configure something like say it was a, a IBM specific, you mm -hmm. know, custom networking. Now every release cycle, we have to deal with integrating that or getting it upstream, yeah. um, you know, maintaining that all different, especially if we have, you know, for us, we're, you know, managing over hundred clouds. Mm -hmm. If we start doing them all slightly differently now, yeah. that, that upgrade process and, and, and that so ongoing on the, management. On process. the network side, like we're, we're more flexible, but we're working via, um, or this is not released yet, but soon, uh, Neutron ACI integration with ACI being mm. Cisco's okay. you know, network Neutron. orchestration and sure. policy framework, yeah. right? So you can do all of that stuff via like ACI, ACI, via Neutron. Sure. Well, I mean, um, I think also from a uh, Cisco perspective, it makes sense when it's like, hey, we're going to do yeah. more stuff on the network side. We might have it, some it engineers. Our, our customers, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, our customers tend to be Cisco a little more networking yeah. biased, and you literally can't throw a rock in Cisco without hitting a CCIE. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that, <laughs> that that's a little, I mean, so how does Rackspace handle that from a, you know, I think you guys go even beyond that point, right, as far as what, from a you know, customer, yeah. like customer focused uh, approach. Well, yeah, so, and again, this is, uh, this is where um, a lot of our time and hours go in is that, while we have a reference architecture that we stick to, uh, we do allow the customer to be a little bit more flexible, or at least I'll say we try to accommodate what the customer ask is in the sense that um, we have certain core services that are part of our core product, right? And that's our reference architecture. But um, if you, came, for example, came to me and you said you have a specific storage, shared storage device and you wanted to integrate that into Cinder, um, we would work with you to make that work. 
Um, now, of course, we would give out the caveat and say that there's no guarantee um, that if just because the driver exists. And this, again, this is, and anyone who deals with OpenStack, you already know this fact. I'm going to say it out loud anyway. Just because the driver exists does not mean that it works, right? <laughs> so we remind the customer that, that just because that driver exists doesn't mean it works. We can give it a go, and we can see how it, how it, how it, how it pans out. Again, we also will be clear with the customer and say that, uh, you know, your, your SLA that we provide you may be adjusted because of this additional feature, right? But uh, we will work with the customer, and it's through our enablement services feature where we also will work with the customer to include a service that's not included in our core product, such as Salometer, mm -hmm. such as Ironic, because um, Ironic is not currently part of our core product. But we will work with the customer through enablement services to be able to in, in, add that additional service to your cloud. Again, with the caveat of understanding that you know, it can affect it, your SLA um, and that our support for you may be limited. Because again, for us, for us, it's all about being able to provide you support. It's not actually about the, the project themselves. It's about how, what level of support can we provide you when you call us and you have a problem with that service. If we don't feel comfortable giving you a superior level or a fanatical level of support. <laughs> I was waiting for um, that. <laughs> yeah, it, I have to throw it in. I'm, I'm paid to say fanatical at least twice a day. Um, if we can't feel like we can't provide that to you, then we won't offer that service up, and we will offer it up through our enablement services, and it'll have a different SLA and a different uh, support around that. So that's that's so how it, we approach and it. Even a higher level of flexibility yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's trust me, it's 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 pain and pleasure. It's pleasure for everyone else. <laughs> yeah. It's pain for us. Yeah. But uh, but but again, that's that's the approach that yeah. we uh, we have taken. Just, well, just so you guys know, um, you can feel free to get up and ask questions at any point. Like yeah, this yeah, is yeah. A, don't let us ramble on. Even, I mean, I, we end. said we were yeah, supposed to be interactive, but we've been talking for the past twenty minutes. I'm sorry about that. This is what happens. This is like literally us talking in the hallway. Uh, uh, <laughs> side note, but yeah. Cool. So, I mean, that brings up a good point: is if you're, hey, look, well, we have these services. We can test up. How do you help a customer decide? Because obviously, there's additional costs, right? Yes. So, if, we're, if there's services yes. involved or anything like that, so how do you help a customer decide if it's worthwhile? Right. So, is the juice worth the squeeze? Like, hey, <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, we we did all this extra stuff to get this right. project supported. Cool. We just wanted to kick the tires on it. Generally, isn't a good right. uh, use case. So, our, our path to that, and again, I, I I'm no longer. I used to be a cloud architect for Rackspace. Now, I'm I've moved on and doing some technical marketing stuff. But once an SA, always an SA. <laughs> um, and and I, the way we kind of handle that is that we hold a two day workshop, and basically we come on site to the customer, and we literally pull out all the dirty laundry. Uh, of, of from the beginning of top of the architecture, dealing with the security, the network admins, everybody, and they kind of all get a chance to kind of put their stuff out on the table. And then from there, we kind of evaluate what we think is the best route to go, and we provide them back a, a cloud design that they physically will have in their hand at that point, and they can go off and either choose to go with one of you guys or choose to go with us, right? That, that, that cloud design does not mean that you're tied to us. It just means that this is, the, this is what we suggest the path mm -hmm. you go on. Sure. Now, does that help, you know, when that gets to the point of like, well, this one extra thing that the network team wants is going to cost us X extra, how does, how do you help the customers kind of, or is that just, uh, hey, look, this is what it costs. Do you want right. to do it or not? Right. Well, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. We do talk a lot of people off the ledge with a lot of some of the wacky stuff <laughs> yeah. they want to do. Um, and, and, and it's for the same reason you said is that it, it didn't come from a, a ask from the business. Yep. Right? It came from the network admin who thought they would be pretty cool to do this thing. Yeah, why and do you it, want to do this? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And while that thing, even though it was published you know, online and he read a blog post that someone did it with <laughs> OpenStack, does not mean that it's going to work at his level or his capacity, right? Sure. So you know, a lot of times we do end up kind of going the same route you do, which is kind of talking them off the ledge. Um, at the same token, if we feel that you know, it's going to be 100, you know, 100, you know, you know, 110, you know, thousand dollars worth of professional services to get that service, you know, and they're paying 15k a month, right? That that there, there's a there's an yeah. offset there, right? That doesn't really make sense, right? So we obviously, you know, it, it, there, and I will be open and honest to say we do turn down opportunities like that because we feel that it's not it's not beneficial for us to get involved. It's like what's what's the business value, right? How are you quantifying the? the and you have to ask the customer, right? What, how, how do you quantify the business value? Sure. You know, of this of this right. service, like how are you going to when the you know, if the CFO looks at this and is like, how do you justify this? Right. You know, oh, I read a blog post and it looked really cool. Yeah. Probably not going to. I want to put it on my resume. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Right? That's really what it boils down to yeah. a lot yeah. of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like you said, for us, that's we spend a lot of time. Same with customers is, is really talking them out of something. We're like, that that's cool. That sounds good. But yeah. let's talk through the process. And and like you said, it goes it goes beyond the initial. Can we get it working? Then how do we keep it working? How do we upgrade it with the next release? What's the what's the life cycle of that yeah. individual project or tool? Like, where's the direction of that going? Does it make sense? 
um, because it just has these ongoing and ongoing effects. Yeah. Um, because let's just say it's something that's just going to slow down your upgrade cycle. If right. it slows it down enough where you're falling out of the easy yeah. upgrade window, now it has yep. all these pile-on costs and effects. Yep. So that if, that initial yep. fifty thousand dollar thing to do it yep. may be fine, but it may have all these drag-on effects. I know, know there's still people out there running on Essex and Folsom. So oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. yes they are. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes they are. Yeah. Yeah. That, of which is a really bad idea. Um, <laughs> OpenStack is so much better now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if you haven't tried anything post-dated of Ice House, you need to you need to just stop and try the new stuff. Try Newton, try Mataka. You yeah. will be amazed at how much better it is. Yeah, the that's customers, just another note. The customers we get that are totally new to OpenStack, like, what does everyone complain about? This yeah, is right, yeah. yeah. This is stable. It actually works, yeah. right? Absolutely. But like, like they upgrade it all the time. It's no big deal. <laughs> So uh, speaking of that, so how do you, how do you handle with all your different customer clouds? How do you guys handle upgrades like on an ongoing basis? Is it pretty regular? Like ours, ours is pretty straightforward. So we do we're we're you know agile. So every like four to six weeks, we'll do like a point release that's just you know bug fixes, minor mm -hmm. patches, minor UI enhancements, and stuff like that. And then every six months, we do a major release. We only replatform once a year. So. Okay. Uh, we'll do a major release every six months, which sometimes we'll pull in projects from from a more recent release. You know, uh, Heat was the most recent one, um, things like that. But we only actually upgrade the whole you know base version of everything in OpenStack once a year, okay. and we found that that's kind of a good compromise between yep. speed of upgrade and the sure. fact that you know it, it can be a bit of a pain to do those upgrades. So, do you run into any challenges from like a? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I guess you know with the API compatibility, where if like if you're pulling in projects from from different versions or anything, or generally no. Issues we wouldn't there. do it if there was going to be a major issue, okay. right? Like, uh, and it's you know, most I'd say like you know, ninety percent of the projects we run are, are all the same version. But it's like okay, you know, um, back when we were running um, what, um, I'm trying my. my <laughs> Ice House, Screen right? Yeah. We were running back when we were running Ice House. Ice House Heat was kind of meh, right? Yeah. Juno Heat performed really well. was mm -hmm. was a heck of a lot better, right? So we mm -hmm. pulled in Juno Heat, um, and it you know there's no compatibility issues. No, sure. you know, no, that and, and that's kind of we're very conservative sure. on on that stuff. You know, our our main goal, like we tell our customers, like we're not trying to be cutting edge. We're not trying to give you the the latest the, the latest release, the latest versions of packages. Yeah. What we're trying to give you is a cool. rock stable platform that's ready sure. for enterprise production workloads. Yeah, I mean we're we're similar, mm -hmm. but. Uh, a bit more aggressive from the standpoint of um, we'll, we'll do more release, so generally quarterly about, and oh, we wow. will pull in new OpenStack versions, but it goes back okay. to that. If you're really strict with your, you know, what our clouds look like, it's a lot easier for us to get there. So I think we did our Mataka release in June, mm -hmm. and all of our clouds are already on Mataka, and I think it was cool. four to six weeks or something to get them all there. That's good. So, oh, that's and cool. we just did a new, uh, another quarterly, it's still Mataka, it's not Newton yet, um, but then we'll do all those clouds. So, so that's where, that's, for us, that's where the payoff of like, well, we know exactly what all these clouds look like yeah. and they're all the same. So yeah. this goes a little quicker. How do, how right. do you guys handle upgrades? Right. So, and this is where we're probably not as aggressive in the sense that um, we probably give our customers too many options as far as whether that they choose to upgrade. So every time a major OpenStack release comes out, the .o release, you know, we will release, we will release a .o release of that new OpenStack. So for example, when Newton comes out, our 14.0 will be out in the next month or so. We won't force a customer to upgrade to that. There will be an upgrade path available for them for, for 14.1. So for 14.1, it will be all about being able to make a path to upgrade. But we give the customer the option to upgrade or not to upgrade. And again, this is where we run into some situations because the end of life support for certain releases. Um, and again, I will openly, honestly say we need to do a little bit better with that. But um, we do have the capability of doing the upgrade. Um, and we just aren't as forceful as we probably should be because, you know, we should be more forceful, I'll be honest with you. But it is what it is, so you have options. But being able to upgrade is there at your own leisure, basically. Sure. How do you how do you think having you know, more flexibility affects the customer? You know, we were talking earlier skill sets. Like, hey, if you're doing managed, generally you don't need super crazy OpenStack people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, has any effect on for for you if you do stuff that's a little more uh, a little more um, you know farm to table OpenStack uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of? Uh, if there does, do, does that require the customer to be a little bit more advanced? Do you think or, uh, or? well, yes and no, and 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 a lot of times customers that you know. 
the, the customers that are adopting are usually coming from virtualization, right? Sure. So their enterprises used to virtualization. Virtualization didn't change. You know, you don't do a major upgrade in virtualization every year. You don't do it every six months. You do it every two years, every three years, mm -hmm. right? So they are used to that model. Sure. So you know, it, it's one of those situations where they're like, well, I don't want to upgrade every six months. I don't want to upgrade <laughs> once a year. I know. Yeah. Um, and we do have customers still running older versions of OpenStack. And we fill in the gaps. And, and, and what changes is, is the level of support we're able to provide you, right? Because there's no more upstream support for it. So you know, we can only do but so much if you find a, a severe problem in that, in that older release. Um, but you know, we, you know, it's, I kind of lost my point there, I'm going to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, but you know, we kind of just we, we find a way to bridge, to bridge the gap. Sure. Um, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, I lost, my, I lost my point. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Yeah, I don't remember what I was saying. Spec I don't remember what I was talking about. Yeah, it's hard to accommodate their customers, you know. Yeah. Well, so as a former racker, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's yeah. part of the yeah. Almost, culture. Almost, yeah, it's, it's, it's a part of our culture to kind of give you what you want, which is could be, like I said, a good and a bad thing. Sure. Um, yeah. What do you, so, so we've talked a lot about skill sets, required skill sets, how, you know, what's a good base point. What do you, so if you're, if these are skill sets are pretty hard to find, right? Mm. Would you agree in yes. general? If yes. you're like, hey, I want yes. an open stack engineer. No, it, it hard doesn't. to find usually equals expensive, expensive. right? Yes, so absolutely. Hard absolutely. to find equals expensive. So then potentially as a customer, you're looking for someone that you may be paying at a higher rate than the rest of your engineers. That's, that. and yeah, absolutely. Potentially, what, how do you get and how do you keep that kind of talent? So that, that was one of the points in the, the broken stack talk I made because it's, it's a major, especially for traditional IT companies, mm -hmm. you know, where they're, they're paying their regular admins half the going rate of an open stack admin mm -hmm. and they bring an open stack talent and then alienate their, you know, Ish. existing talent, you know, and um, it's, it's incredibly challenging. And for us, a big part of our value prop is, you know, we, we our message is basically OpenStack, you know, private cloud consumed like you would a public cloud, right? Sure. So you, you need experts in consuming it. You don't need to know anything about running it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and obviously, you know, it's, it's in the customer's advantage to have some familiarity with OpenStack from an operational perspective. Sure. Um, but we do everything soup to nuts from the hardware all the way up through the APIs, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they don't actually need to. Um, and when, when it comes down to like, how do, how do you do that, right? Like you need, you need to budget for it. You need to, get, you know, and, and it's like, if you're a really traditional company, how do you retain someone on the cutting edge? Like, how do you make that job interesting? You know, I don't know the answer to that. And if you yeah. look, there've been a couple mass exoduses from major companies where, uh, and if you, if you watch the video of, of the talk I gave yesterday, we, we, we didn't mention any names, but there may have been some logos put up there <laughs> where like 30, you know, senior OpenStack engineers from one company in like a six month period moved to My another group. company, yes. um, all with, you know, job title increases and yep. raises. Yep. Sure. Um, and I mean, like, I, I don't know that, that anyone has figured out how to solve that problem, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we're in a similar mindset where, hey, you don't need those people to that degree. You should know something about OpenStack. And we do that yeah. as part of our onboarding, some, some training to, like, help people get the basics. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think it really comes down to the only way, you know, it, I, to me, it, it takes me back, you know, maybe 10, 20 years or something where the, you didn't just go out and hire people. Yeah. Your, your, your people learned. Yeah. Right? right? So then it was, hey, here's this new tech. You have some spare time and some spare yep. kit. You can go learn about this tech. Now we have someone that knows about it, and we're getting a home team discount because we let that person or people go learn that yeah. stuff all the time. So they're happy with with what yep. they're doing. I think OpenStack's no different in that aspect. And now I'm even getting yeah, and that's, I mean that's ra perfect. Yeah. Rackspace is a perfect example of that, right? Mm -hmm. They've they've homegrown hundreds and hundreds of OpenStack engineers. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, and, and it's primarily because our model is a little bit different, whereas. We're, we're, we want you to see us as a staff augment to your organization, right? Not replacing your organization, but like kind of adding to it. And, and that's because we have a few models, right? We have a model where we'll host it and manage it in our data center. We have a model where we will support it in your data center. And we also have another model where we will support it in a third party data center that's not even ours or yours, but maybe somebody else's, right? So with that being said, we ha we're a little bit more flexible in the sense that we, we, we're here to add value to whatever staff you have. Um, it may be good to have some staff that does know OpenStack um, and, you know, and will at least be able to talk, talk to us on that same level. And it's hard to retain, it's hard to retain OpenStack engineers. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you because it's, 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 it goes to the highest bidder sometimes. Um, the only thing I, I will say, and I, I'll just attest to this from Rackspace, is it's about the culture, right? If you create a culture that people enjoy, yeah, yeah. they'll hang around. Um, and yeah. until, you know, somebody in the audience offers me more and, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm yours. Right? 
No. Toy Mets is good. <laughs> yeah, I know. No we, we, we were co-workers. We were, we, were, we were peers, co-workers on the same team. It's true. Uh, you know, he's decided to leave me, which is okay. I'm still hanging out, but, you know. <laughs> well, you, you, you did leave the, the SA side, and now you're a, a TME, so. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. because, you know, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but to, to Tyler's point, right, like, I think that's a big, a big risk you have to take into account if you're looking to DIY or do a distro-based solution. Um, I, I think you... In order to be successful, you need real commitment from senior leadership Mm -hmm. in terms of budget, in terms of staffing. Um, Because if you can't create an interesting environment full of smart people, you know, all of whom are extremely talented, you're going to have a huge retention problem. And the the acquisition cost, you know, talking to HR people, um, I've heard numbers anywhere from $40,000 to $100,000 in acquisition costs for a single OpenStack engineer. And so building a team, I mean, that's a lot of money, right? Just just to hire them. And if you're churning through them at a a rapid rate, like that's... The pool's not that big to begin with. You, know? no. you can't just keep reaching in for, for another one. Uh, you, you run right. it pretty quick. And, and then and, also and geography. You get a bad rep. Well, if, if you turn through like five or six OpenStack yeah. engineers from different companies and they're sure. all like, man, this place sucks, yeah. right? Like you're not gonna be able to hire anyone else sure. because they're gonna right. talk to their friends. They're gonna come to Barcelona, you know, and they're gonna yep. be like, don't work for these guys. Yeah. You know? <laughs> cats out the bag, yeah. for sure. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's, yeah, that's a key piece. Oh, I think we have a, we have a question oh. back there. <laughs> no, oh, no, snap. no, you can't answer a question. You're not allowed. <laughs> We're not allowed to answer a question. I'm a consumer and I'm sold on your services, but I say, yeah, your core services look great, but uh, when do you use this half a million dollars of hardware that I already have here on my site? Yeah. Okay, so the question is for, oh, for the recording is the, uh, hey, cool, I like all your yeah, stuff, right? I like your, your services, but I, I just bought a bunch of gear and I have it here and I have servers because we try to do our own open stack, so yep. can I use your stuff? Yeah. Um, so, so, how would, so in, in our case, we have, uh, you want to you start, yeah, Walter? Go ahead, well, here you go. Walter's like, yes, yes, give me that one. I will I will modestly say that we would love to take that challenge. We will be able to consume your hardware, manage it, give you an SLA on top of it, and life is great, right? So you don't have to go out and purchase, you don't have to go out and throw away all that gear you brought. <laughs> Are you making faces at me? It's true, <laughs> it's true. No, but no, and that's again, that's one of the consumption models is, is that we can manage and operate an OpenStack cloud that is running on your hardware ooh, 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 in your data center. He's had too many sangrias. <laughs> <laughs> no more sangrias, sir. Um, you, <laughs> that's in the recording, too. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's gonna be like, Walter's a jerk. <laughs> No, we can we can consume we can consume and manage and operate an OpenStack cloud running on your hardware and your data center. Yeah. How about awesome. you guys? So um, we have the ability to do that as well, but it would be sow based work, which no one wants to really do. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that we prefer to do it, we have a prescriptive control plane, which consists of three controller nodes and a bunch of net gear, and that's because we do the hardware accelerated yep. neutron, right? So you need to have the ASR routers, um, and we're, we're pretty prescriptive on the networking side because um, we have something that we think is really special in the industry and works really well. Okay, that's all the, the plugging for Cisco. <laughs> that's, that's it. We're cutting it off there. But um, so. You know, we have this kind of ki- control plane kit that we w- we would prefer for our customers to run upon. The, the other advantage is, like, when we do upgrades and everything, we know it's going to work because it's on exactly the same gear, right? But when it comes to the hypervisors, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can you can run it on a, on a pizza box or you know a bunch of blades you got sitting around or what what have you, um, as long as it meets the minimum hardware specs and isn't like you know an ancient POS. Like, it's fine. Sure. Yeah. So for us, we mm. we don't do that, right? So we won't consume existing hardware and it goes back to that that whole SLA thing of hey if, we, if you if you're banking on us meeting these SLA requirements saying we're gonna yep. we're gonna keep this whole you know control plane and everything up and running we're gonna keep you on mm-hmm. latest versions um, we got to know what that hardware is we got to know it's supportable you know it's supported it's and and it's and we also even do so we we offer a hosted version that's in our data centers or we can put it in your data center and we even match the um, server Design so from a standpoint, of CPUs, RAM, right. disk oh, wow. in the servers, cool. they're the same. They're not the exact same servers, but they're the same specs mm-hmm. gotcha. in customer data center. Ours again, very predictable environment yeah. means uh, you know very predictable for us to keep it up and running. But the the side effect of that for for customers is or pe- anyone even our ISV partners that build stuff on top is mm-hmm. they know exactly say oh it's it's twenty enterprise nodes or something. Like, oh, yeah. we know exactly what that looks. like. So we've like. got the full spectrum here. We've got yeah. like yeah. we'll run on yeah. anything. We've got <laughs> prescriptive control yeah. plane and flexible hypes, and we've got. Yeah. Prescriptive everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you let them run it on, on Intel Nux, right? If well, you know, hey, you know, you line up a whole bunch of desktops that you've had laying around <laughs> and wire them together. Um, no, I mean, we, we have, obviously, we have. As long a re- as the check's clear? Yeah, right. as long as the check's clear. No, obviously, we have a reference architecture that we, we have to follow, but it does, you know, it's only tied to as long as that hardware can run a certain OS, which 
most hardware can is certified for it. Um, that's pretty much it. And then, of course, we apply our reference architecture to whatever your hardware is. We move, we slice it up, or whatever storage you're using, we figure out how to, mm -hmm. how to consume it. That's actually, um, that brings up a good question you mentioned, uh, operating system. Uh, obviously, you guys managing curate, we yeah. managing curate on an open stack piece, but operating system-wise underneath, do you yes. let the customers, do customers have options there, or you're no. saying, we're managing it, so no. it's none of your business? No. Yeah, yeah, Red, no, Red Hat for us. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's, it's it, well, it's, it's not a, well, I don't, I like, I like how you phrase it, we're managing it, it's none of your business. It is none of your business, but, <laughs> but yeah. no, no, it, 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 we are, we are, because we use OpenStack Ansible to deploy our clouds for our customers, right? Uh, the underlying right now has to be Ubuntu because Ubuntu is the only OS that, that really works for it right now. They are working for one for CentOS, but it's not ready yet. Uh, so Ubuntu 14.04 or whatever better is, is the base operating system that we, we rely on. Yeah. Yeah, we just we're we're Ubuntu right now, and yeah. same thing. We have a tool called Ursula. It's okay. very similar to OpenStack Ansible. It uses Ansible, yep. um, so it's focused on on deploying. For, for what it's worth, we literally just in our last release replatformed from Ubuntu to Red Hat. So until <laughs> our last release, we were also on Ubuntu. Okay, okay cool. Very cool. <clears throat> very cool. We also have a red. Well, anyway, I won't. I won't. Go, I, <laughs> yeah. I, won't I won't. I won't play really bad competitor on stage. <laughs> I, 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 no, that's I, what they're I'll here for. No, go for no, it. No, no. We have a Red Hat offering as well, but I mean, we, we partner with Red Hat just like. Just like Cisco, so you know we're both partners with Red Hat, and we will support their their offering. Even though I am true to true to trunk, yeah. OpenStack, <laughs> my personal life, yeah. but we do have that as well. Hey, well, what are you doing your own personal life? <laughs> I know, <laughs> no, I know, but you know. Anyway, all right. Well, we're just about out of time. Is there any last questions or, yes? Hold on, hold on. We're told we're told you got to have a mic because yeah. it's important. Because then we'll have to, otherwise we'll have to repeat it. We won't get the full yeah. question. Yeah, and you know on the recording, we, everyone we want the recording to hear your fantastic question. Uh, the I don't on. know how fantastic or annoying it is, but uh, <laughs> when you mentioned updates in OpenStack and your customer skips several releases and then suddenly he decides, oh, I need the newest version, and he's beh uh, behind two or three releases. So how challenging do you find it? Well. Um, as, so I'll start by this way. As long as they're on our ISOS release, which is version nine, which is most customers are there because we pushed. So there was a period of time where we stopped, we stopped actually doing releases of our product because we wanted to better, make it better and make a new reference architecture for it. So from version four to version nine, we, we just stopped, right? So if you were on version four, we, we encourage everybody to go to version nine, which was IceHouse. And at that point, you were consuming our new reference architecture. So if you stopped, and say you didn't, you didn't move from Ice House and now you want Newton. We can actually make that happen because it's still following our new reference architecture. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit more painful. Um, it may require a longer maintenance period, but we can actually do that for a customer because, it's, because it, is, it is on our new reference architecture. If it was not, if it's predated to that, then it would be a nightmare. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's for us, it's, we have that like, well, technically you can delay updates. Thank you. Um, but then that next piece is talking them out of why that's a terrible idea. Say like, well, again, it may be timely, costly, whatever. You're not doing the upgrades. You're not, you know, it's a certain, think about, you know, you don't, you don't realize whether it's AWS, Google, you know, Rackspace, Public Cloud, they're doing updates all the yep. time. You don't know it. You, it's that <clears> mindset <throat> of traditional software. Like, oh, I had ESX 3.5 and I'm upgrading to ESX 4 and that's a big upgrade. Mm -hmm. and, and, and OpenStack's more like that model, right? We, we have software versioning, but when you're providing as a service, it's like, hey, well, think about it as a service. We're just chugging along. Yep. Now, obviously, if it's disruptive, we want to schedule it and make sure we can get through those. But if they're non-disruptive, we, we want a customer have a really good reason not to do it. Um, and generally, it's just a comfort level thing than it is a technical requirement. Yeah, we, we really try hard not to let customers get too far behind. Um, we did, I mean, back uh, a year plus ago when we switched from Nova Network to new, hardware accelerated Neutron, um, that was a big migration. So that was one where, you know, I think we still have one or two customers on Nova Network because it's like new gear and, yeah. you know, but All once, once, once again, we're kind of in, in the Rackspace situation now where we have a new reference architecture that we've, you know, really firmly established, works really well, got customers running, you know, thousand plus nodes. Um, so like, you know, we're, it's got, it's they're better. good from here, yeah, here yeah. on out, right? Yes, that but, makes uh, sense. But yeah, there's probably a couple stragglers still out there. All right, I think we are out of time. Yes, thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Thank you guys. Any more, any more, shame, any more shameless plugs? Any more shameless <laughs> plugs? Cisco? No more shameless, okay, <laughs> can I give one shameless plug? Yeah. This soccer ball, there are only 22 people at the summit who have one of these soccer balls. You wanna know why? 
They took the OpenStack Fix Your Stack Challenge at the Rackspace booth. If you <laughs> are interested in one of these soccer balls, come take the challenge tomorrow. It's at our booth. It's not hard. I promise you. I broke the, I broke the clouds. So I can tell you how to fix them if you're really nice to me. You doing any but more book signings, is, Walter? Uh, no, my book signings are over. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you didn't get a copy of my book, I apologize. Don't we'll talk about my book. I hate talking. <laughs> but stop by the booth. Come on. You know you want one. This is a soccer ball. Only 25 people have these at the summit. This is a commodity.